As the central governmental structure of the Romans collapsed into fragmented local powers, Britons struggled to maintain some semblance of Roman culture as they retreated before the invading Germanic peoples. Many of these Romanized Britons fled to France, to what is now called Brittany. In Britain itself, Christianity, Latin scholarship, and the remnants of Roman civilization in general survived among those Britons who retreated westward and northward before the Germanic invaders. One of these Britons, St. Patrick, has been credited with transplanting this Christian civilization to Ireland. As of the end of the 6th century A.D., the emerging English world was a backwater of Western civilization, an enclave of illiterate pagans in Christianized Western Europe. Markets disappeared and population declined. The economy of Britain was in general less sophisticated in the 6th century than it had been in Roman times. This economic retrogression was manifested in many ways. The market agriculture of Roman times gave way to smaller farms and subsistence farming. Imitations of Roman mass-produced goods began to be crudely handmade. The use of coins declined. Pottery ceased to be mass-produced. Roads and waterways fell into disrepair. Central heating and hot baths disappeared for many centuries. So did bricks, which the Romans used, but which did not reappear in Britain until the fourteenth century, when they were imported from the continent. Glass bottles, which had been produced in Roman times, disappeared from England and did not reappear until Elizabethan times, when bottles began to be imported from Venice, and it was the seventeenth century before glass blowing was re-established in the British Isles. These post-Roman retrogressions pervaded both the lives and deaths of the times. The barbarian invaders practiced cremation of the dead, but, among the Christian Britons, people were now buried more crudely, in shallower graves, and increasingly without coffins. The military vulnerability of fragmented post-Roman Britain was illustrated by the variety of raiders and invaders who struck various parts of the island. Although many of these invaders were referred to generically at the time as Saxons, they included, besides people from Saxony, Danes, who settled in the East Midlands, and Norwegians, who settled in the northwest of England. The degree to which England was altered by the invasions of Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and others, and by the later Norman invasions, may be indicated by the fact that the present-day English language contains very few words from the language of the Britons in pre-Roman times, though it contains many words of Latin, Germanic, and French origin. The Germanic conquerors, some from what is now Germany and others from Scandinavia, brought with them some of the skills that the Romans had, but not all. They could not build in stone, for example. Only after centuries of religious missionary work did the English become part of the Christian tradition of the West. The Norman invasion and conquest of England in 1066 marked the last of the great cultural and racial additions to British society from continental Europe. A people of Norse origins, the Normans had become culturally French after their conquests in France during the century and a half preceding their invasion of England. Concurrently, individual bands of Normans launched campaigns of conquest in southern Italy and Sicily, and still later, Normans would also be involved as individuals in the Spanish reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula from its Islamic rulers. In addition to being renowned warriors, the Normans were also effective as rulers, creating a reign of law and order under which economic development flourished in Normandy. They were also active in building and patronizing churches and schools, both of which were outstanding by the standards of the times. That the Normans came from France was not incidental, for France was in the forefront of European civilization, while England still lagged behind. The decisive Battle of Hastings, which settled the fate of England in 1066, was fought by about 7,000 men on each side, large numbers for their day, though very small compared to the armies of a later era of the Industrial Revolution and its accompanying advances in transportation. Thus the Normans came to put their stamp on England and eventually on Britain as a whole. The Norman conquest meant not simply the replacement of one king with another, but a widespread takeover of land and power by Normans, a cultural revolution among the upper classes of the country, a strengthening of the power of the monarchy, an architectural revolution, 
and an infusion of new racial strains into an already mixed population. To the original Britons of prehistoric times had been added, over the centuries, the Celtic invaders of the 5th century B.C., the Roman invaders of the 1st century A.D., the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes of the 5th century, Scandinavians in the 9th century, and now the Normans in the 11th century, a mixture of peoples and cultures today very loosely characterized as Anglo-Saxon. The role of these successive conquests over the ages may be assessed to some extent by the relative development of England, which, being nearest to the continent, received their fullest impact, as compared to the development of Wales, which was much less affected, or of Scotland or Ireland, which escaped conquest for centuries, largely through the accident of geography. In the wake of the Norman conquest came the French language and culture which became dominant in the political and elite social life of England. The English people were excluded from the top secular and religious posts. Parliamentary proceedings and the law were in French, as was social discourse among the aristocracy, while Latin was the language of religious and scholarly work. The English language and culture remained largely that of the masses and the lesser gentry. The fact that the Normans held territory on the continent of Europe as well as in England that the early kings of England were also dukes of Normandy, made the ruling class especially distinct from the English society that they ruled. King Edward III, whose reign began more than two and a half centuries after the Norman conquest, was perhaps the first king of England who spoke more than a few words of the English language. Eventually, however, both the Norman rulers and those English who came in contact with them tended to become bilingual. The Normans were noted for their adaptability, one of the secrets of their success, but over the centuries they were said to adapt themselves out of existence. Intermarriage began early at the lower social levels and then proceeded up the scale, until eventually even kings began to marry women of English ancestry. The English language and culture correspondingly rose up the social scale over the generations and centuries. In the middle of the thirteenth century, an important state document was circulated in English, though this was unusual at the time. In the fourteenth century, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales marked the beginning of an epoch in the use of English in literature. By the early fifteenth century, parliamentary records and official correspondence were written in English. This was also the first century in which members of the upper classes began to correspond with one another in English. The social and cultural absorption of the Norman elite into English society was aided by the loss of the Norman connections with France, as a series of wars led ultimately to the loss of their continental territories. This loss of the continental empire was accompanied by further conquests within the British Isles. The English invaded Ireland in 1169, conquered Wales by 1284, and invaded Scotland in 1296. Individual members of the Anglo-Norman aristocracy typically had multiple landholdings over which they ruled in various parts of the British Isles, so that, despite their local attachments, they were to varying extents a national ruling class, rather than simply regional barons. It has been estimated that nearly a third of all English earls in the 13th century also held land in Scotland, while most Scottish earls held land in England. All these tendencies toward a more consolidated and inward-looking Britain, developing separately from continental Europe, were accentuated by Henry VIII's rupture with the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. 